You know, the thing about human factors, as I said in the introduction that you may have read, is it's the buzzword. And uh, I earn so much beer and so many dinners now by talking about human factors. And my mentor in human factors was a great guy called Roger Green. And Roger said to me, do you know what, Baggers? He said, human factors is common sense. And what we do as scientists is we turn this common sense that everybody knows all about into great big scientific concepts so that we can spend 50 minutes at skydive impressing you with all this science. At the end, you walk out of here saying, bloody hell, that was common sense, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. So there we are. It, it's all common sense. So I'm speaking in a personal capacity, although I'm the chairman of the General Aviation Safety Council, and I'm professor of aviation medicine at King's College, and I'm a CA flight examiner, and, uh, and, and, and I'm only 19 as well. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but, but actually, I, I, I'm not here representing anybody other than yourselves. And... Um, in this presentation, because I'm a professor, I steal everybody else's information. So I'm pleased to acknowledge any images there that I've borrowed from public websites. And I say, you know, if you're going to put it on the website, tough, people are going to use it. So I acknowledge any, co any copyright. There we are. So who am I? So there's me learning to fly. And um, <laughs> a long time ago, and, and um, as, I, as I said, I'm Mike Bagshaw. I started life as a pilot um, and... Um, studied medicine somehow. I, you, you're all too young to remember the Reader's Digest, but the Reader's Digest used to be a monthly journal, and there were things like, I am John's liver and I am John's kidney, and that's how I learned my medicine. And um, so I practiced for many years, didn't get very good, so um, I had to care. Anyway, I spent six, 16 years in the Air Force. I flew hunters and jaguars. I was a flying instructor, um, and I was a test pilot. Um, I spent 12 years as head of medical service of British Airways. Um, I, all this time I've flown as well. Um, I own a couple of aeroplanes and as I say I'm a CAA flight examiner. So, uh, okay. And all began. But back in 1970-71 I built my hours for my ATPL by being a jump pilot. I used to fly that uh, 175 there which uh, we took the doors off and uh, I was saying to Kieran, used to bore to altitude, chuck them out and then bore the way down. How many cylinders I wrecked in that time, I've no idea. <laughs> but I was a young lad, so it didn't matter. So, um, and, and I, di I did a few um, uh, jumps myself. I did static line. And we used the old double L canopies. Do you remember the uh, ex-military thing? So um, double L. So to see a square canopy was really something very exciting. So, uh, um, but I never got to fly a square canopy. I only ever jumped double Ls, but, uh, which meant I went straight down really. Okay, and there we are. We chucked them out on a static line, and um, uh, and, and I was telling Kieran that uh, on my first flight, if those of you who've been Cessna pilots will know how important it is to put the brake on, um, so that when you put one foot on the step, one foot on the um, on the wheel, the wheel doesn't spin, and uh, uh, and, and that's that's what used to happen. I used to think, God, these guys are really cool, you know, hanging on the strut, and then when when we landed, um, they were very cross, you know. You should put the fucking brake on, you know. Anyway, there you go. So, 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 so that, that was my introduction to human factors, really, um, all, all, that, all that time ago. Okay, so what is this stuff about human factors? It, it, it's all in the middle, isn't it? it? It's management systems, it's task, it's environment. And in the middle of everything, whether I'm talking to you as jump pilots and jumpers, whether I'm talking to um, a conference of nuclear scientists, whether I'm talking to people from British Rail, God help us, um, you know, the... the it's the same thing. It's how you, as the person, interact and interface with what you're doing. And it's a bit sort of, as I said, it's, it's the thing of the moment. But ladies and gentlemen, it's real. It's you, how you operate. And really, what I'm here to do is to give you some tools, tell you the common sense, and it will give you tools for what you're doing, whether you're piloting or whether you're jumping out the back or whether you're packing or whether you're managing the airport, whatever you're doing, okay, in the middle of it all is you, the human being. And what we're aiming to do in Human Factors, really, is to get that picture rather than that one, really. <laughs> you know, and uh, the good news, he lived. Okay, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't show you a guy dying, um, but there we are. It, it's, um, that's Human Factors because it's a perfectly serviceable aeroplane. It's perhaps doing a stupid thing, but it's a perfectly serviceable aeroplane. And it crashed, okay. And there we are um, when things go wrong. 
Okay, and that, that incident, some of you may recognise it, and that was human factors. Good news, he survived too. So I, I don't believe, although I'm a doctor, I don't believe in showing you death. Um, I show you life, because that's what it's about. Okay. Now let's look at aviation, look at flying, look at commercial world. And we can see that if we look at the accidents per million departures since 1960, only goes through to 1990, but look what's happened. It's come down and it wiggles along the bottom. And the thing that stops it going to zero, of course, is the human being. Okay. And it's the same whether we're talking about nuclear fuel accidents, whether we're talking about railway accidents, whether we're talking about anything else. But that sums up how we've changed as a society. And I was talking to Kieran earlier and we were discussing how, um, how regulated we are now, how, how much is controlled, how we don't have the freedom. The good old days when I, you know, we just used to jump out of aeroplanes and you know, if we couldn't see the ground, bit of wind, it doesn't matter, we sort it out. Um, we don't do that anymore. We're much closer regulated and things have got safer. And notwithstanding the Boeing 737 MAX and all those and the South Atlantic accidents and so on, generally things are better. And if we look at what's going on in your business, you know, it's getting better, isn't it? So there's from 2000 to 2019. Um, and what I found very interesting was there on the bottom that um, landings, just the same as flying an aeroplane, same flying a canopy, um, it's landing that's the hard bit. And that's where the accidents are. And uh, you might say, well, what's human factors got to do with that? Well, what human factors got to do with that is understanding it, is stopping it happening. And remember, we're talking about managing threats, threat and error management, okay? We're mitigating the threat. You've got to think through what might happen and how can I stop it happening? And if it happens, you're going to make errors. We all make errors. Okay, the big error I've just made, of course, is I don't have my pointer, it's locked away. So I've made an error, but I'm mitigating it by waving my arms around, so it's fine. So that's human factors. But interesting, isn't it, that only 5% were reserve problems, and I'd like to know what the 15 other, 15% 15 other were. And again, being a professor, I've got to show you tables, and um, if, if we look at parachuting risks, this is from BPA. This is data from BPA, which shows that the more jumps you do, the more your chances of death or serious injury. I told you it was common sense, okay? <laughs> Obviously, so if you've done 10,000 jumps in your life, your risk of death or serious injury is 45%, but you know what, you die of old age, so your death rate's gonna go up anyway, isn't it? So we could um, dri drive a coach and horses through that. Okay, and is it safe? Well, you all do it, or you're all involved in some way with it, and you all know that skydiving, there's the risk, one in 101,000, compared with hang gliders. I hope there's no hang gliders here. There aren't many hang gliders left, actually. They all die. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, they, uh, <laughs> um, um, but uh, you know, if, 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 any of you, if any of you are still around, guys, um, you, your risk is one, one in 560. And uh, we, compare that with American football, where your risk is one in, one in 50,000. And uh, Grand Prix racing, yeah, OK, there's that, is that, is that. And canoeing's pretty awful, isn't it? One in 10,000, you know, going over a weir. But uh, there we are. So, yeah, it's safe. And why is it safe? It's safe because you think of the risks, you regulate it, you, you carry a reserve, you learn about packing, you make sure everything's right. And those of us who fly, we look after the aeroplane as well as the um, people jumping out as well. Now, this is interesting. If you look at medicine, just this only comes from the doctor, you see, I'm showing off again. But uh, there we are. Did you know that nearly 15% of people admitted to hospital, something goes wrong, which is not to do with the underlying. This is pre-COVID, okay? This is not catching COVID. This is something else going wrong in hospital. 10 to 15% of those patients. So keep away from hospitals, <laughs> all right? And half of them are surgical patients and half the things going wrong are in the operating room. So, yeah, I, I'll, I'll tell you a story. I, I, I was having some work done on, on a testicle. I'm a man, I got testicles and um, <laughs> The, um, I, I was having an operation on a testicle and the surgeon said to his students gathered around there, this is Professor Bagshaw and everything goes wrong with our colleagues. So he said, it's really, we've got to make double sure, threat and error management, that we get this absolutely right because his chances of it going wrong are higher than average. And that's a fact, okay? 
And then you proceeded to say, right, we're doing the operation on the left testicle, aren't we? And I said, yes. And you proceeded to mark the right testicle. <laughs> and that's a true story. So I grabbed the pen and said, no, not this one. Yeah. And I'm still talking in a deep voice, so it's all right. Um, yeah, yeah. So there you are. So there's a load of bollocks for you. Um, uh, right. Now, occasionally your friends drop in. And again, a perfectly serviceable aeroplane and a perfectly serviceable house. But something went wrong. Okay, and it's the, it's the human thing, isn't it? And when we look at aviation accidents, those of you who are pilots, who've done the exams, will know that the correct answer, what percentage of accidents are human error? 73%, assume a factor, 73%. Uh, not sure I agree with that, you know. It's, when we talk about human error, there's always a chain. You look about error, anything, car accident, canoeing accident, parachuting accident, flying accident, riding your motorbike, whatever it is, you, um, you can always look back and say, footprints in the sand, if only I'd spotted that, if only I'd thought about that, if only we thought, that's life. Yeah. Yeah, when she says I'm pregnant, oh my God, if only I'd worn a condom. Um, the, the, but it's the inability of, of, of the human to, to break that error chain, isn't it? And what we say is in, in air crew, we say it's 70%. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that because if we look at crew resource management, this is when you talk to each other. Now, those of you who jump out of the aeroplane, you probably don't have much conversation with the person who's driving. Um, but it's all CRM. It's all working together, isn't it? You know, and as I said, I was a jump pilot, so I know. Um, and if we look here at accident courses, there's the 73%. And then it says weather, and it says aircraft, and it says other. Do you know, if they get the weather wrong, someone's made a mistake or not foreseen something. If the wing falls off the aeroplane, okay, there's a human involved somewhere. So I would put it to you folks that actually human factors, human error is 100%, okay, if you look at it that way. But any of you doing your exams, it's 73%. <laughs> but but, but for, for real, it's 100%. And you think back of what you do, you, you know, you take out the wind, the weather, the cloud base, the temperature, the kit you're using, what you're aiming to do, and all the rest of it, it's there. And you know, if you're going to turn off the runway, at least check what the snow depth is. You feel such a prat when you <laughs> suddenly get a whiteout, and, uh, you, and explain that to the boss. Um, but that's human, that's human error. Things have gone wrong, there's snow, there's landing, there's not planning ahead, and all those things. Now, when I was a test pilot at Farnborough, um, a long it, w it wasn't in 1915 I was a test pilot, I hasten to add, but I was going through my desk drawers when I was clearing out, and I found this, um, th this thing here which said, a standard pilot. Okay, and back in 1915, AV Row, Avro, you know, Avro the company, Avro Vulcan, Avro Lancaster, um, AV Row built all their aeroplanes around what they considered to be a standard pilot. So the standard pilot has that back length, that thigh length, that angle, etc., etc. Isn't that a load of bollocks, though? Because there's no such thing as a standard pilot. Look around this room. Every single one of you is a different size and shape. And if I were to open your brains, we would find a completely different brain uh, processing thing as well. And we're psychologically different, as well as physically different. This is for the ladies. Um, you know, so we've got the ectomorph, the e mesomorph, the endomorph. It's all right. The guy on the right doesn't have to go on a diet. That's how he's made. And the guy on the left doesn't have to eat high carbs because that's the way he's made. And it's all right. We're all different. So we vary in all these ways, don't we? How intelligent we are, um, our aptitude for things. You know, um, I, I'm, as I said, I'm a flight examiner and flight instructor, and just occasionally I've got to say to people, have you thought about taking up water skiing? Um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, uh, if you want your thrills, because you're never going to fly an aeroplane. Um, personality, and I want to major a little bit on personality, because there's introverts and there's extroverts, of course, but a little bit more about that. Let's have a look. I think, okay, he's uh, the great psychologist man, wasn't he? He was the guru. And he said that personality very just two dimensions. We don't really agree with that. But when we look round the outside, there's the unstable and the stable, there's the extrovert and the introvert. And there you are. You look at uh, uh, the pre former president of France, who's stupidly extrovert. And then we get uh, Jane Goodall, who's well known as an introvert. And if you go round the outside, you can all recognise things on there. 
the sociable, outgoing, the talkative. I'm, you probably gathered I'm a bit extrovert. But maybe my extroversion is covering up my insecurity and my introversion. And maybe I'm giving you this great extrovert presentation because I'm scared stiff. Do you think I am? <laughs> no. No, you're wrong. <laughs> no, I've been doing this a long time. Um, but, but you never know. And you guys, when I say guys, I include girl, gals, so people, you people, um, you're all working together. You're the whole business of skydiving is teamwork, isn't it? And you, you trust each other, and you work with each other, you trust your instructor, you trust your packer, you trust the weather forecaster, you trust your pilot. Everybody is trusting everybody else. And we've got to take account of that when we adapt our style and adapt how we communicate. And, you know, an extrovert can get very pissed off sometimes with someone who's just in their shell. Maybe they're just scared, but maybe they're not. Maybe they're introverted. And the introvert gets really fed up with the extrovert going on about lights and dancing, see you in the pub and all the rest of it. Most of you are extroverts, I know that. But um, not all of you. And some of the ones you think are extroverts are not extroverts. And that's, uh, that's the thing, yeah. Yeah, so someone agreeing at the back, so that's, yeah. I, I planted in there, I said I'll give you five pound if you nod at the right place. So, okay, see you later. Right, um, but we, we have to take account, and we have to think. We learn the skills, we learn how to exit the aeroplane, we learn how to do all the things we do, we learn how to land, we learn the emergencies. But you know, you've got to learn beyond that. You've got to learn how you relate to people and how you communicate with people. And by communication, Hopefully, we're going to prevent the accidents and prevent the incidents by you understanding where you're all coming from, understanding what you're doing. We all brief. Of course we do. We have the brief. We have the pre-walk brief. We have the brief before we go. We have the brief before we get in the aeroplane. We have the brief, 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 brief. Yeah. Does that really get to the heart of it? It probably does, but there's probably a bit more needed. Don't be frightened to challenge. Don't be frightened to communicate. Don't, we're all equal. We all want to walk away from whatever we're doing. So coming back to this then, this personality stuff. So it's the psychotic, it's the neurotics, it's the extroverts, the introverts. Okay. And when I worked in the Air Force, we, we were always trying to define what the ideal personality was to be a fighter pilot. So I was, I was a fighter pilot, I flew hunters and jaguars and things. And um, uh, so I fit, perhaps fit the mould. But the truckies, the guys flying the Hercules and so on, are a different sort of person. They work in a crew, they work in a team. They, they have different skills and different personality. And the hard thing, when I, I was an instructor at Cranwell, we were teaching people to be fast jet pilots, and some of them were clearly never going to be fast jet pilots. But they became extremely good um, V-force pilots or transport pilots, and that was their metier. Okay, and you've got to think about that when you go, you know, the, the, the big formations you guys do, you know, I'm so impressed, fantastic. But you, um, you know, perhaps not everybody is suited to that. And you've just got to take that into account, haven't you? And they're not a wimp, they're not a failure, they're just different. And, you know, we get into the melancholy then and the phlegmatic and the sanguine and all these big words, don't we? Which um, are relevant, probably. And you don't need to think that. You just need to be open-minded and you've got to communicate well. And the secret of everything is communication. And when we think about communication, it's not just words. More of that in a minute. So there we are. The, um, so there's the extroverted personality. I think with you guys, your extroverted personality is way out there, actually, um, to do that sort of thing. But there you are. I, I'm, that's just my... That was a joke. You're supposed to laugh. That's fine. Thank you. Right. Okay. Fine. Okay. Cut. Right. Um, so we're coming back, aren't we, to personalities. We're coming back to attitudes. How we approach life. How we are. The fact you've all come here, I'm really impressed. You've just had your lunch. You've had a beer. You've had a sandwich. And at two o'clock, you've come and sat in this hot room to hear this guy talking common sense. That's the right attitude. And shows your personality is in the same, the same area. So what's your personality is, is what, you, what you are. That's your inherent characteristic. You can't change that. That's your personality. What you can change, though, is your behaviour. 
Okay. By the time you're 21, 22, your personality is fixed. And you'll never change your personality from that age. But your behaviour, that's different. You can moderate your behaviour at any time. And you've got to moderate your behaviour to suit the situation you're in and what you're doing. And it's the expectation of the, the, the peer group you're with. It's the expectation of others around you. And your own personal expectation. And you've got to limit your expectations to what you can do. And this is where the attitudes come in, your attitude to what you're doing, your, your confidence, your knowledge, your technical ability. And here's attitudes that, you know, the, the anti-authority, you know, I, he's not bloody telling me what to do. You know, I know that. Okay. The answer to that, mate, follow the rules. They're there to save your life. Okay, I'm impulsive. You all know impulsive people. Okay, got to get on, do something quickly. Never mind, let's get it done. I'm a bit like that. And uh, hang on, stop, think. I teach people in multi-engine aeroplanes, and I, I, I used to fly biz jets and things, and I'd say, when, apart from the engine failure on takeoff, at any other time, if you get an emergency, do nothing. Sit on your hands, wait, okay? You won't die immediately. You'll die immediately if it's just after takeoff, but if it's not just after takeoff, <laughs> sit on your hands, okay? So think first, the macho, right, I take me out. <laughs> right, I've seen a few of these wandering around today. They're amazing tattoos. Um, the take, taking risks to impress other people. Okay, that's not really very wise, is it? And uh, then the invulnerability. I see that a lot in your, in your, your, okay, accidents only happen to other people. So I don't need to worry. I'll be okay. Yeah, it could happen to you. You could be that blue aeroplane upside down. Okay. And then there's the resignation. Okay, what's the use anyway? You know, it's, I'm not helpless. You can make a difference. So you just think of your colleagues, think of your friends, even think of your family, and you will recognise different attitudes in them, won't you? And how do you change that attitude? If it's their personality, that's how they are, but they've got to behave differently. Okay, marriage guidance, terrible business. Okay, and uh, what you're doing in marriage guidance is getting people to moderate the behaviour. Same when you go flying. Why did that incident happen? Well, we need to think about it. We need to think about behaviour. So behaviour. Behaviour, it, it's that function of what you expect, isn't it? Your expectation. I've said that already. Your own ideals and values and those of the people you're with and how you're made. Genetics. Do you know, genetics is the most powerful thing. I'm a doctor, as I keep telling you, okay, and I know oh, your risk of heart attack, blah, 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 so smoking, obesity, high blood fats, blah, blah, blah. Do you know, it's your parents. It's ge your genetics, and you can't do much about that. So I would say to you, ladies and gentlemen, choose the right parents <laughs> to stay safe. Okay, right. Okay, and then your behaviour is going to be different as an individual and in a group. In a group, you have a risky shift. You have the thing of everybody working together. Everybody trying, you're all trying to impress people, and um, you're trying to aim for a common aim. When you're on your own, it's very different. Okay. And the dynamics of a group, so it's, we get this conformity where you change behaviour to try and fit in with the group norm. And you may not be very comfortable with that, but that's what you've got to do. Okay. And then the compliant, how you re react to this compliance, what you're required to do, what the rules are, what the expectations are. And you want to be compliant, don't you? And then this thing called risky shift, which is where the group is saying, you know, the, yeah, we should do this. Right, okay, the wind's a bit strong. Yeah, a little bit of low cloud around. But, you know, we can, we can hack this. But you think, no, I'm not very happy about this. But you won't say that, will you? You'll say, well, actually, these, these people are all very experienced. Okay, so I'll go, yeah, okay, I'll agree. That's where we're shifting the risk from yourself onto the group. Okay, and then it depends whether you've got a long group, whether you're all the way together on a detachment, so you've all gone to stay somewhere and you're all working close together. That's a long group duration, and your behaviour will change. Whereas if you just meet up at the airfield in the morning and you're just working together for a couple of hours and then you're going down the pub, um, and that's why it's important to have standard operating procedures. So you all know what you're expected to do, what you're doing, and how you do it. Okay. Oh, these big words. Cognition is thinking. Okay. That's what goes on in the brain. So cognitive style, so the anti-authority. I've mentioned these already. The, um, you don't want to be told what to do. The impulsive, the invulnerable, the macho. 
just repeating what I put off on that previous slide. Okay. And then the external control, where you give in, okay, the CAA says this, therefore we have no option. Yeah, it's probably true, really. <laughs> um, there we go. Which brings me now to leadership and how you lead a group, how you lead people, all right. And the ideal manager, okay, confident, relaxed, yes, okay. All right, communicate, yep, talk to people, fine. Okay, involves everybody, yeah, accepts criticism, yeah, tell me, tell me, yeah, it's fine, fine, bastard. Um, and uh, <laughs> technically competent, doing their own thing, okay, and they gain respect. Now, those of you who are group leaders, you all recognise yourselves there, don't you? Because this is the problem with the human being. We're all perfect drivers. I drove up the M1 this morning, and by golly, there's some idiots. And every one of those idiots was thinking, by golly, there are some idiots. <laughs> okay? Because we all know we're all fantastic people. We're all great leaders. We're all great team members. And we've got to think that. Otherwise, we couldn't do life. Okay? But don't forget that it's your own opinion. And I, I, I told you I worked for BA for 12 years. I ran the medical services. And we introduced something called 360 Feedback. You know, where my, my staff, I had, um, I had 600 staff, and my staff could all tell me what they thought about me. <laughs> I cried for days. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? We, we, we all believe in ourselves, and it's quite hard to think back. And you, ladies and gentlemen, have got to do this. You've got to question yourself. You've got to say, all right, do I really meet all those things? And if not, what do I do about it? And there's thousands of pounds to be made from becoming a management consultant and telling people the bleeding obvious. So there we are. Which is, is that? Okay. So teamwork. We all work together in a team. Now, I'm going to give you another concept, which is your well-being. Well-being is another thing of time, isn't it? So your well-being is how you are. Your well-being at the moment is hot and stuffy, and there's a lot of hot air coming from the front, which is making hotter, hotter and stuffier still, but I'll... I'll cool it down in a minute, but how you are, how you feel, and it's really important. And if your well-being's not good, that's not a good time to go flying or to go jumping, is it? And what we're made of, the physical. Okay, so how are we? You know, physically, the psychological, and what's the third one? If it was a small class, I'd ask for suggestions, but you've probably all thought of it already. There it is, the emotional. Okay, and we all know this is life, nothing to do with aviation. This is everything. We all interact with everything else and it all makes up your total well-being so the physical is obviously how you are if you've got a headache you know you've got temperature do you feel all right psychological how do you feel the emotional yeah okay we won't go into that too much but notice how they overlap in this dry diagram and this diagram is stolen from lots of lots of things isn't it there we are so if if you've got flu influ I, re I mean real flu not man flu um, you'll feel you'll feel a bit depressed that's the psychology. If you're suffering from depression, and we all do occasionally, so real depression, you'll get a headache, you won't have much appetite, and so on. And um, if you discover that the Pope wasn't really a Catholic at all, um, you'll probably find you've got physical and psychological reaction to that as well. But there's another circle, folks, and that's that one. And that circle is what you show the outside world. Now, you've I know some of you, and some of you know me, but most of you don't. So you've sat there for the last half hour and you've formed an impression about me. So I'm fit, I'm well, yep, okay, I'm happy, I'm not depressed. You don't know that though, do you? You don't know I'm not depressed. And you don't know that I haven't got something wrong with me. Because I'm showing you what I want to show you. And that's what we do. We show each other, and you've got to remember that each other is showing you. And I, I know as a flying instructor, as a flight examiner, I sit in the flight deck and the person sitting next to me is showing me what they want to show me. I don't really know anything about them. You've got to bear that in mind because really, there you are, before Tosca <laughs> threw herself off the ramparts and the castle in Rome, what you don't know actually is that the dungeons are full of people who fail their human factors exams. So there you are, don't give in. But that's how we are. We don't know what's beyond the ramparts, do we? And you know, 
you don't know. Your personality, how you're seeing, we don't know what we're seeing. And when we, when we think about stress now, oh God, here we go, stress, yes, yep. Yeah. Um, human factors is not stress. Okay, stress is life. Hang on, Mike, you said that human factors is life. Well, it is. It's all life. And stress is that. So that's the simple thing. So if you put a, a demand on your body, okay, it's going to respond. Okay. And if you take in the, the, the pilots here, if you take in your ATPL exams, that's the definition for the ATPL. Um, it, it, but it, what we're really saying is take anything and you bend it, it'll break. And you reach the limit, you're in Young's modulus, you get to the point where it'll fracture. And you are the same. And your personality won't change, your behaviour will, and your well-being will. So those well-being circles vary day by day. And you've probably heard the concept of the bucket, you know, filling up. You're filling up your bucket, you can't cope anymore. But remember, we all talk rather glibly about stress. And stress isn't the same as pressure. Stress is actually a pathology. Stress is actually the body's reaction to something. Whereas pressure is what we feel. It's, um, it's that positive subjective feeling. A bit of pressure gets us going, helps us to achieve goals. And these days, we live in a very namby-pamby society, don't we? You know, the, even the Daily Telegraph, the supplement of the Daily Telegraph is full of crap about health and well-being and stuff because we focus so much on it these days. And stress is part of life. You can feel stress. You're allowed to feel stress. You're allowed to feel pressure. It's all right. It's not an illness. Okay? It's life. And you've got to accept that. And, and those of you who've got families and those of you who are young, um, these days we, everything's got to be right. Everything, well-being has to be perfect. It can't be perfect because we will get stress. We will get pressure in our lives. And the trouble is, though, is when the pressure becomes too great, that's when we get the stress. They have different kinds of stress, aren't there? There's life stress, so, you know, um, your partner's not the right person, the mortgage wants paying, the car's broken down. Environments, like we got today, so it's too hot in this room. It's pressure at the moment, but it's, if, I, if I go on much longer, it'll become stressful, I know that, <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be all right. And then, task, what you're trying to do, and... If you work for an organisation, as I keep telling you, I work for British Airways, I know all about organisational stress. I also worked for the National Health Service at one time, but that's another lecture. <laughs> so what are the effects? Just think. Your, think back 4,000 years. Think about your ancestor. So your ancestor's got, he's going to be a male. So it's, because it's 4,000 years ago, he's going to be a bit sexist. So. No apologies here. So here we are, I've got the club over the shoulder, you're walking through the jungle, you're on your way home, and you're dragging the wife by the hair as you do, and then you, um, you hear the rustle of saber-toothed tiger in the jungle, the slurp of saber-toothed tiger saliva, and you hear the jungle padding. You look at the sundial on your watch. Because you're a pilot, it's a brightling sundial, and, uh, <laughs> and you see it's one o'clock, and blimey, that's saber-toothed tiger lunchtime. So what do you do? Well, first thing you do is drop the wife, isn't it? And then you, uh, and then you run like mad. Your heart rate goes up, doesn't it, to get, get the blood pumping round. You sweat to get rid of the, the um, extra heat you're producing. You breathe more quickly because you want to shift the carbon dioxide. Your um, eyes change so you can see the saber-toothed tiger coming to bite you. And, uh, yeah, and it's fight or flight. It's adrenaline. We don't call it adrenaline now, it's epinephrine. If any doctors in the room, epinephrine. But uh, we, we all think of it as adrenaline. So the adrenaline reaction, run away, get safe, okay. And that's the first effect, isn't it? So we then, if you think in modern terms, so you're, we're taking you up today and the engine fails. Or you're flying with me as the flight examiner and I give you something hard to do, okay. It's not really a appropriate to do the final thing of the stress reaction, which is to empty your <laughs> stomach, empty your bowel, empty your bladder, so that you become lighter, so you can run more quickly, and you hope that the saber-toothed tiger will slip in the mess. Um, so so that, that's the sort of reaction. But you can't do that, can you? Now go back to my three circles. That was the physical. 
let's go to the psychological and the emotional. And this is now where the psychology comes into place and you don't do all that. Yeah, your heart rate goes up, you, pop, you, know, you're, you breathe a bit more quickly, you sweat a bit and so on. But what takes over is what's going on in the psychology. So you omit things. You, you miss something out. So the vital check. Okay, the final check is that pin in place. You get stress. No, it wasn't. Okay. So we, we, mi we make an error. Okay. We cue thing. Now cueing, and the pilots here will know all about that, where you manage your time and you, um, you put things in order and do them in the appropriate way. What the human body does when it cues, it doesn't follow any logical sequence. Okay. And unbeknown to you, things get cued and you don't do them in the right order. Okay, you filter things out, and um, again, if you're in an aeroplane, and the first thing that you filter out is, sa is, is sound. You don't hear instruction. You don't hear people speaking. And you've all experienced that, I'm sure, where you, you're under training or you're under instruction or whatever you're doing, and you didn't hear your instructor say something, and they've got to say it again. And you go on a flight deck, and mm, so many times you'll hear the, air traffic, uh, the, the pilots asking air traffic control to repeat something. They just didn't hear it. Okay. And it's all due to stress. You cone attention, you regress to what you used to do, and eventually you run away. Okay. And it's all down to fight or flight. Now, I told you at the beginning, this is common sense. I told you you knew all this. So, yeah. I make no apology, though. Okay. So, there we are. Everything's going fine. So, in flight safety, we've said that, haven't we? We've said that 70 to 80% of accidents are due to some human factor or other. And I also mentioned that it's, it's always a chain of events. Chain, and when we have an incident or an accident, it's been the inability of that human. The human is the weak link. Now, I gave a lecture to the Royal Society once. When I got the phone call, they said, we'd like to give a lecture to the Royal Society. I said, the Royal Society of what? <laughs> um, that wasn't a good start. Anyway, I gave, a le I gave a lecture to the Royal Society on which I said, the human, is the human the strongest link or is the human the weakest link? And the answer, of course, is both, isn't it? You know, if you think about it, the things that computers can do and the things that humans can do, okay, humans can think, humans can, uh, they're not very good at analysis, but they're very good at making the appropriate decision which way to go. Whereas computers are useless at that. Computers follow the algorithm. Okay. So the human is the strongest but can be the weakest. And if we think about the circles and think about all that, um, we, we're, we're there. You will make errors. Everybody makes errors. And what we're trying to do in aviation is to design systems and procedures that minimise the effects. The big word these days is mitigate. So we say mitigate the error, minimise the effects of the error. And that's what you're doing in your procedures, your process, when you're learning your safety procedures, you're learning how we're going to stop the effects of that error. You will not stop the error. The error will happen. Okay. So in commercial aviation, we have a flight deck. We have more than one person on the flight deck. And the important thing is that they communicate. Okay. And I've mentioned this already, that the communication is what underlies life, really. Look at a marriage or a relationship going wrong, and the starting point is always, nearly always, lack of communication. Okay. And it's the same in any team, in anything. When you're, um, when you're at the airfield, when you're at your training, whatever you're doing, it's communicate, communicate, communicate. But, now here's a bit of a bind for a professor who's spent his life trying to communicate to people. You only listen to a third. And I'm sure if I went back through those slides, you'd say, oh yeah, yeah, he did say that, didn't I? Because you own, you, you hear it, you, you've heard every word I've said, and, and thank you very much for laughing at the appropriate places, I'm very grateful. Um, but um, I get paid on the number of laughs. Um, so the, you only listen to a third. And even worse is of all the words that are said, you actually only perceive the meaning of about 7%. And that, just think about that. So 93% of what I've said has been a waste of time. <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? Because you're already 
thinking, what do you say about that? What do you, say about, you, know, what do you mean about that? That, that, that? No, I've gone. It's gone. Okay? And so the, the, that's why we try and finish with a message, isn't it? You take this message home. <coughs> that's it. Because you won't perceive everything. I say 7%. And that's uh, 38% is the way we say it. Okay, so I could actually just stood here and I, I'm good afternoon I'm here to talk to you about human factors I'd like to tell you that human factors underlie everything we talk about really and when we think yeah okay point made mm. so it's how it's how you do it isn't it how you say it and the body language looping around okay and it's the same out on the field it's the same in the hangar it's your you learn so much about how they stand <laughs> okay and it's really, really important to remember that, that the communication is not just talk. So giving a briefing, what we're going to do today, how we're going to do it, what might go wrong. Don't forget it's not just reading out the SOPs, okay? Because reading out the SOPs will not have a very good effect. They only listen to a third, the perception is 7%, and body language is half of it. So you think of the the great leaders in your business, the great jumpers, the great team leaders, they're the guys and girls who stand up there and they grab you, okay, with the way they communicate. We've got to learn it, you know. You're not born as a community. I, I see there's a, a baby at the back there, and they start them young these days, well done. Um, <laughs> the, um, um, but, you know, we have a standard baby. I talked about standard pilots and standard people. Um, we have a standard baby, really although we start to recognise their traits, don't they, as they grow up. And my, my grandchildren are much better than your grandchildren. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, we, we recognise the trait. But they have to learn how to communicate. And you as a parent have to teach them to communicate. And you as instructors have to teach how to communicate. And those of you responsible for safety really have to think about communication. So it's a learned skill. You need to remember some of these, these things I'm teaching you today. So there we are, the strength of the team. So I showed you the first picture of a, of a flight deck. That was the DC-10 with three on the flight deck. Now we're down to two on a flight deck, and the flight engineer has been replaced by this. OK, so there's no communication there then. So how do you make decisions? Decision making is the thing, isn't it? So we classic decision making. Are we going to fly today? Are we going to jump today? Are we going to deploy to Hibblestow? What are we going to do today? Are we going to go all up to Cumbernauld? Okay, so classical decision making, you weigh everything up, don't you? And you, um, what course of action? How can we do this? What's the best way to do it? And you select the most appropriate. With what we call naturalistic decision making, this is where you bring back your past experience. And I'm concerned um, in commercial aviation at how many very young people have been appointed as captains to the left-hand seat. They're very competent, they're fantastic. They're really knowledgeable, their technical skills are great. They haven't had any experience yet. Okay, and if you think, do you remember the Qantas accident, incident where they lost an engine and it, it all the bits from the engine went through the other engines and they, um, uh, they didn't have any hydraulics, they didn't have any electrics, they didn't have, it was a big, big A380. Huge, huge, and it took them five hours for the crew to decide the best course of action to save that aeroplane. And they saved it. Okay. But if it had been an inexperienced crew, they had nothing to look back at. Look at Sullenberger, look at the um, Chelsea, the, 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 um, the bird strike you know, in, in North America where they ended up on the Hudson River. Okay. It was the experience of the captain and the co-pilot and he's the first to say I couldn't have done it without the co-pilot okay so he got all the glory and got a film made about him but it was a team effort and it was because they were both really experienced that they saved that aeroplane had they not had the experience the outcome might have been difficult now I'm not in any way criticizing young captains they do a great job but I just worry sometimes that we need some experience okay and in aeronautical decision making the judgment and the attitudes which I've beaten to death. So how do we get these errors? We, we generate errors because we're not processing things properly. 
Okay, are we not monitoring what we do? Are we checking? Are we so busy monitoring somebody else that we're not monitoring ourselves? And that's an important thing to take away from this. Don't forget yourself, okay, as well as supervising others. And the latent failure is where the system is wrong, okay, and something happens or you make an inappropriate action. So error, active error, do it wrong. Latent error is designed wrongly. You can do a lot about active. You can't do much about latent, but then you've got to build in a mitigation because I know that this aeroplane has got a crappy control for so-and-so. I must allow for that. Okay. Supervision, operational conditions, dynamics. I've talked about that. I said I work for BA. <laughs> there we are. All these things. And we get the errors by something going wrong internally. Okay. We've done it wrong. We're overconfident. <laughs> Not enough care, your cognitive style is not right. And then what's going on outside? The ergonomics, where is the handle? Where is the pin? Where is it? What? When? Okay, who on earth designed it to go there? Yeah, okay. And the economics. Now, we're coming to the end. Um, so a whole another lecture would be on all the visual illusions and perceptions and how we see things, because how you see it isn't necessarily how it is, okay? And disorientation, not seeing what we should see. And you know, if you break the rules, you deserve to die, okay? So it's your decision if you break the rules, but that's a violation. And I'm here to talk to you about the human factors, about mitigating the effects of errors, and if you blow it out of the water by breaking the rules, you're on your own. But sadly, you're not. You bring somebody else down with you, okay? And you bring in new rules and regulations which affect everybody else. So if you decide to violate the rules, it's not just you having a good time that day, okay? Doing it wrong, we all make mistakes. And remember that any accident, there's a whole complexity that's built it up. I said in my blurb, if any of you bothered to read it, you'd hear about Swiss cheese. There we are, the Swiss cheese, Jim Reason at Manchester. He says, quite rightly, if we look at all the holes, take some slices of Swiss cheese and line up all the holes, if the hazards or whatever's going wrong finds a whole line of holes that will come out the other end and something will go wrong. And it's your job to block it. Your job is to stop wherever you do. So here we've got active failures, we've got latent failures, and if we put in all those things, how the organisation works, the preconditions, who's supervising you, what you've done, somewhere in that line you want to line up a blank to close the hole. And that's the Swiss cheese thing. I told you it was common sense. And there's the chain, of course, the chain of errors. There we are. It goes wrong when you break the chain something happens. Funny old thing, human factors is there. And look where I stole this from. Fire department incident safety officer. And it goes back to my original point that human factors applies whatever you do. Okay, so I deliberately stole that from something that's not aviation because it applies to everything we do. So remember, complex interaction. Let's look for where, why those errors happened. Let's stop them happening again. Do something about it, okay? Check the kit. Make sure it's right. You do, of course you do. Your life depends on it. But we still have tragedies. The ergonomics, how we design it, how God designed the human being. Are you the fat guy on the right, the thin guy on the left? That's how you are, okay? How we do the controls, and of course you're under pressure. I knew as a jump pilot back in the 70s, you know, we need, I needed to get a certain number of drops done that day for them to stay in business. Okay, so the utilisation and the organisation, the dynamics of the group. So, recognise it. The point of today, ladies and gentlemen, is just to introduce you a little bit. Think about the trays, think about your weaknesses, and we want to trap any errors, keep them within our... So, mitigate it, don't break the error chain, okay. So in your briefing, 
in aviation now, we're, he we're heavy on threat and error management. Okay, identify what threats might there are to this flight today. So, how do we manage it? How do we mitigate those errors? It could be something simple like the cloud base or the wind gusting or something wrong with the airplane. Maintain your priorities. And the priority is staying alive. And your priority is keeping everybody else alive. Don't forget that. Take it back. Okay. Finally, in human factors, we have the dirty dozen. So here we are. So here's the music. Here's the lights. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the dirty dozen. Lack of knowledge. Lack of awareness. <coughs> lack of assertiveness. Communication. I've majored on that a bit, haven't I? Okay. Lack of teamwork. Lack of resources. Distraction. Complacency. Fatigue. Stress, I've mentioned. And pressure. They're not the same. And there we are. That's the worst. Well, we've always done it that way. Yeah. Can you think of that? You can relate that, can't you? To your own life, to your own operation. There we go. That's a very silly thing. So that's not silly at all. So, ladies and gentlemen, the take-home message is we are all human beings. As human beings, errors will occur. And what we have to do is to communicate, to understand the differences between us all and the differences in yourself. And you're not as brilliant as you think you are. Thank you very much. Any questions? Now, what, as a professor, I should now be asking you questions. Okay, what percentage of the... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no hands up. You've got to get out of this heat, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks for coming, folks, and enjoy the rest of the exposition. Thank you. Yeah, cheers.